All right, hide. No, that I don't want to do. Laboratories at the University of Florida. 
the MAC Lab is the world leading magnet laboratory developing and operating high magnetic field facilities for more for about 2,000 scientists that use this um, capacity annually for research in physics, biology, bioengineering, chemistry, geochemistry, biochemistry, material science. So, so from my perspective, if you take a survey and we have one universal cell. My hope in this talk is to convey how unusual the quasi particle can be in so much smarter physics. So, do we have one more mic? Or we got? Um, I can send it to you. I can I just sign it. So, you can. Yeah. Okay. So, you want to present. Um, I'll give a brief introduction to the magnet lab and, and how the extra material is so important in modern day cement physics. So I'll give um, a discussion of the heart of quantum matter and in particular describe what is quantum matter. And then we'll start looking at the unusual quasi particle. So charged systems. Uh, one is the two-dimensional metal. And the other is the copper oxygen square lattice. So just a square lattice of copper at each of the intersections. And then I'll tr transfer to spin systems, a triangular lattice in two dimensions, a triangular lattice in two dimensions. or that's large enough to fit mice and rats next and then our other campus is the university of florida uh where we have an advanced mri uh and across the facility and our physics shows they can uh, they have modest magnetic fields 17 tesla but they can go to the temperature like one million kelvin and stay there for six weeks. So the rate of the over temperature is extremely high, which you need uh, to hear twice, I guess. <laughs> Next. And then the third site is at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where we have the country's largest uh, Instead, we take energy off the grid and we spin up uh, the rotor uh, and then connect it to the magnet, 
text. And to give you a sense of scale, these are not the two uh, shortest people in the magnet lens. Um, this is a motor where the shaft is between one and 1.5 meters in diameter. Um, next. So if you look at the different, um, can we turn off the commands at the top of the page? Yeah. If we um, look at different technologies of um, magnets, that's one way for a magnet lab to determine if it's world leading. So if you look at superconducting magnets by year, the field is crept up. Um, this is resistive electromagnets. These are hybrid magnets that combine both resistive and superconducting magnets. And this is the 45 decor that I told you about. And then if you want to go to higher fields, you have pulse the magnets. You turn the magnet on and off rapidly enough that it doesn't melt. And you don't create five tons of molten copper in under a second. And if you have your pulse lasting more than 50 milliseconds, you can get to 60 tesla. If you're willing to do your experiment in one to 10 milliseconds, you can actually get to 101 tesla. So each of these circles is a maglev world record. Okay. And so the current world record, 101 tesla, 60 tesla for longer pulse magnets. We got 45.17 tesla, the Chinese in 1999. The Chinese just a month, uh, just two weeks ago, announced 45.22 Tesla. Uh, we're recording. Okay, so I'll wrap that up. Um, and uh, no, no, not yet. The resistive magnets, we get to 41.5, and we build a 32 Tesla all superconducting magnet, which is the highest superconducting magnetic field in the world. Next. I'll go ahead and push them. Okay. Yep. So, the MagLab attracts researchers from around the world. This is the only joke you'll get that had to do with magnetic fields and attraction. Um, in 2021, the MagLab hosted experiments by more than 1,600 users. This is during a pandemic year. Usually it's, a, it's around 2,000 users a year. And this is where they come from. So the people in purple originated from all these universities and research institutions to come to Tallahassee for a DC magnets. The ones in red went to Los Alamos for pulse magnets, and the ones in blue went to University of Florida for either our magnetic resonance imaging or our ultra low temperature. And in a single year, a total of 279 institutions from throughout the world. And we're very proud of the fact that there are national magnet labs in Europe, in China, and Japan, and occasionally those researchers come to use our magnetic fields. And next year, we will have a line that goes from Bogota to uh, Tallahassee because uh, Paula Geraldo, uh, Gala Geraldo um, uh, came to use the magnets uh, several months ago. Uh, and, and so we're very pleased about that. As you can see, we don't have a lot of participation from South America, a few from institutions in Brazil. And of course it changes every year. Uh, we generate this at every year. Except for years with pandemics, where everything is a little bit different, about 20% of our users come from outside the United States. And 25% of the principal investigators on those experiments are first time ever at the Magnet Lab. So this is a very dynamic community. And if you uh, submit a proposal for Magnet Time and you win on the reviews, we provide the magnetic fields for free. We pay for the electricity. We pay for all the instrumentation, the expertise, Everything that leads to the education of postdocs and graduate students, and hundreds of postdocs and over 500 graduate students in one year alone, and over 400 referee papers, some from these decorator journals that look good on the coffee table. Wait a minute, we're recording this, aren't we? I'm in deep trouble now. Um, and then uh, physics journals, physical review letters, this uh, applied superconductivity. And chemistry journals, uh, energy and fuels, and other American Chemical Society journals. But 400 referee papers a year. So it's a very active and dynamic community uh, that comes from around the world. Now, 5,000 years ago, the Iceman Society, you know about the Iceman who was discovered up in the Alps. Um, and at that time, they had to find their materials. So his dagger is made of flint, ash wood, animal sinews here and a plant fiber sheet to hold the knife. And then the ax had a copper blade 
Uh, it was fixed with birch tar and leather straps to this wooden handle. So the performance of the tools of the ice stand were limited by the properties of found materials. He did not have access to invented materials. One milestone in the invention of materials uh, occurs with the invention of material that's better than stone for both tools and weapons, and that's bronze, which is 90% copper, 10% tin. The question is, why did this arise 5,000 years ago? I'm not sure that I know why, but for some reason, copper and tin are not found together very often. And so there were very long distance trade routes that were established. Tin from mines in Cornwall, England, Southwest England, have been found as far away as Phoenicia in modern day Lebanon, where they were smelting the bronze. So it could be that bronze awaited the development of very long trade routes in order to be able to get the raw materials uh, together to make bronze. The invention of new materials like bronze, steel, silicon uh, is often motivated by utility, but it's sometimes motivated by aesthetics. So this is a terracotta warrior from uh, the Terracotta Army in Xi'an in modern day China. Uh, these warriors date from uh, around 500 BCE to 220 BCE. All of these colors are found materials, but what about the purple and what about the blue? Well, they use the first synthetic purple pigment and the second synthetic uh, blue pigment. The Egyptians had a blue pigment uh, that was very similar in chemical formula. But Han purple is barium, copper, silicon, oxygen, and the same four elements, but with different ratios of the elements, make blue. And they have to have very good control over their, their temperature in order to get the right color. I'm sure some days they'd be trying to make Han purple, and it comes out it's a Han blue day because the temperature wasn't uh, uh, regulated properly. It's still a mystery how they did this. It's such a complicated process. And it was actually lost after several hundred years. And probably the postdoc forgot to tell the next postdoc about some important step, and the professor hadn't been in the lab for years, and so the technology was lost. But these colors are very important because they protect the emperor in the afterlife, these warriors. If they could not make these people look realistic, then they would sacrifice real warriors and bury them with the emperor. So material science, is the only science that can claim it's been saving lives for more than 2,000 years. So that alone should give us pride in our discipline. I want to also make a point that sometimes science gives rise to art. So for 25,000 years, clay in the human hand has been utilized as a technology. You bake the clay and it hardens up and you have pots. And this has been known for a very long time. So it started as a technology, but then eventually, the craft was developed enough that it's now an art form. So you can buy beautiful ceramic uh, pottery that's developed simply for its artistic merit. Sometimes it goes the other direction. For 4,000 years, sand in the human hand was turned to glass. And glass had such bright colors right off the bat, unlike gemstones, that it immediately was used for its artistic value as, as a trading implement. And this is a modern day glass sculptor in the United States uh, who's, who's incredibly talented. At, and then eventually, glass was used as a technology. This is the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles. No other nation in Europe could make such high quality plate glass mirrors of this size. And so the French made sure that when they were hosting your diplomats, they would take them to this room. And this was the technology of the time that would demonstrate not just um, uh, um, technological merit, but political power as well. And then of course, glass, the invention of fiberglass is what's powering the internet. Wouldn't exist without fiberglass. And we also use it to reinforce our pulse magnets because fiberglass is so strong. Wasn't invented until the 1930s. And modern society now depends upon invented materials and you all have in your pocket or for those of you who are already bored in your hand, the pinnacle of human invention of materials. Uh, this is a photo from way back in 2017. Um, cell phones contain dozens of materials that did not exist just a few dozen years ago. Some examples, the crazy high-speed electronics, the modern cell phone 
has more computing power than the first supercomputers by far. The high impact plastics, when I was a kid and you got a new toy for Christmas, the first time you had to replace the batteries, you'd open the little tab to pull off that lever, it would break in your hand because plastic was brittle and then it was duct tape to keep the batteries inside your toy for the rest of the life of that. The fact today that you can take the back off of your cell phone and bend that plastic, it still blows my mind at age 63 that plastic has become that tough and impact resistant. Powerful neodymium iron ore magnets it cost the car industry $1 billion to develop these more powerful magnets that, that made possible cordless rails. People think that it's the battery that was the revolution on the cordless rail. You can have the best battery in the world, but if you can't generate torque, you don't have a drill. And so it's also the invention of these very powerful magnets that makes uh, cord free power tools a possibility. The bright light emitting diodes. All of a sudden, you have flashlights where you could blind yourself if you looked at the LED in, in the flashlight. What they did is they took some elements from the bottom of the periodic table and they mixed the magnetic field from the electron spin and the electron orbits. So they created what's called spin orbit coupling. And that meant immediately that selection rules that would limit the number of transitions, electronic transitions that could emit light were destroyed. So instead of only one out of four allowed transitions emitting light, the rest emitting heat, all four of them could now emit light. And so in one fell swoop, just by grabbing a few elements from the bottom of the periodic table, they were able to make LEDs four times brighter. And the one that I find most impressive is a transparent metal for the touch screen. For the touch screen to work, it has to be a metal because your finger closes the electric circuit that tells the, the phone what you're pointing at. Uh, and how many metals in your life, look at any metal in your life, they, they're shiny, they're not transparent. Well, this is a common plastic sheet. This is what water bottles are made out of, PET, but it's been coated with indium tin oxide which is a very low carrier density metal, but it conducts well enough uh, that it, it can be an electronic circuit, uh, but it also uh, does not have so many electrons that it reflects light, so it, it transmits light. All right, what is quantum matter? I'm talking about quasi-particles at the heart of quantum matter. What is quantum matter? Well, in some sense, all matter is quantum mechanics. Neutron stars have degenerate baryons. The sun, it's all about nuclear fusion. Common metals, even like copper, contain energy bands. None of these things would be understood without quantum mechanics. That's not what I mean by quantum matter. I mean those materials in which quantum mechanics leads to unexpected emergent properties. So what are emergent properties? To understand emergent properties, let's pretend that electrons are fish. So emergent properties are not able to be linked to a single fish. Or electron. You can study and know everything there is to know about a single fish, and you will get emergent properties from collective behavior of large numbers of fish that can be surprising, they can be beautiful, and they can be very important. Fish survive because they work collectively. Electrons to me are exciting because they behave collectively, and you get all kinds of strange behaviors. And that's what the rest of this talk will be about. So we'll start with two charged systems. First, the two-dimensional metal, and then the copper square lattice. So in a two-dimensional metal, we're going to start with some figures that I was um, I scanned from the dark ages of transparencies before PowerPoint. These come from before the invention of PowerPoint, just to let you know that you're, you're dealing with a historic uh, physicist stuff here. Um, this, was, this was the topic of my thesis. Um, and you apply a magnetic field to electrons that are limited to move in two dimensions. At this time, it would be a quantum well in gallium arsenide, where the electrons can only stay in the gallium arsenide well. And outside of it is aluminum gallium arsenide that costs too much energy to enter. So the electrons felt that it was a two dimensional world. This is before the discovery of gravity. And Lev Landau. Uh, discovered in the early days of quantum mechanics that non-interacting electrons in a magnetic field in two dimensions 
are the identical problem to the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator problem. So the solution for the allowed energy levels in a magnetic field are evenly spaced Landau levels that are spaced by an energy that's proportional to the magnetic field. So if you take a two-dimensional metal and you hold the number of electrons constant and you increase the magnetic field, then fewer Landau levels are occupied by the electrons. So in a low magnetic field, you're occupying the first level and part of the second. At this one particular magnetic field, you're, you're, you've got just the right number of electrons to occupy just the lowest Landau level, and then at still higher fields, you can only partially occupy the lowest Landau level. So at this particular magnetic field, there's, there's no place for the electrons to go with low energy. Here, they can move to other states. Here, they can move to other states. But here they can't. All the states that are accessible are full. They have to spend a lot of energy to hop up to the next Landau level. And so if you measure the resistance of the, oh, that was the point I just made. When an integer number of Landau levels are filled, there's an energy gap. And thus you have to have a finite amount of energy to make an excitation. So if you plot either the resistance or the Hall effect versus magnetic field, this is by Tesla, Every time that you get to integer filling, this is filling factor one, you would get a plateau in the hollow effect. Filling factor two, where you're filling two land levels, there's a, there's a plateau. Filling factor three, another plateau, and you get a zero resistance. You can sort of understand how something special would happen at those fields where you've got an energy gap. But then Stormer and Sui went to higher magnetic fields at the magnet lab when it was still at MIT. 15 Tesla, they went up to 23 Tesla, which was the highest magnetic field to go to at the time. And they discovered something strange was happening at one third. When only one third of the lowest Landau level was filled, where there's no energy gap. So what's going on at one third filling? And as the samples got better, you didn't just see one third, which is way up here, you see two fifths, three sevenths, four uh, uh, fifths, or four ninths. And all these other fractions and the resistivity has zero resistance states at many, many filling factors. So what's going on? If we just have one electron in a magnetic field, I hope you can see these arrows, these black arrows of the magnetic field flux quanta, because magnetic fields come in, in quantized amounts. And we put one electron inside a magnetic field. This is a snapshot of the probability of finding a single electron uh, uh, in a 2D metal pierced by a magnetic field. Each vortex creates a dimple because whenever an electron goes around the magnetic vortex, it changes space by 2 pi. The only way to do that is if the wave function drops to zero wherever you have a vortex. And the, so the probability of finding an electron at the center of a vortex is, is zero, it vanishes. Now, if you then allow your other electrons to be drawn as just spheres of charge, so one electron is a wave function, the others are going to draw as spheres of charge. Where would you put these other electrons? Well, you'd want to keep them apart from each other, and you'd want to put them where this wave function drops to zero. So you would put these electrons right on the vortices. This is the lowest energy state at filling factor one. The Pauli exclusion principle requires that no two electrons reside at the same position. And when all the vortices are populated as above, we're at filling factor one. Okay. So we're at this state, the ground state, when you're at this magnetic field, where the lowest Landau level fill is filled, looks like this in this cartoon. If you're very, if you have a very high speed camera, let's say. All right. Now let's remove, let's lower the electron density to one third the value. So now two out of every three one of these minima is empty. So that is a candidate for what's happening at one third filling. We've only filled one third of those pockets. Um, so there are many permutations. The nature could put the electrons wherever it wants without violating the power exclusion principle. And anytime you give nature many options, and this would be a theme of this talk, nature finds something creative to do. So the avoidance of empty magnetic vortices 
is a big waste of electron kinetic energy. All of this curvature in a wave function is kinetic energy. So you're wasting curvature for this wave function electron. So nature decides to do something else. And what nature decides to do, as was discovered by Bob Laughlin, is that it makes one third as many divots. Three magnetic vortices couple with each electron. You're one third filling, you have three times as many vortices as you do electrons, and three vortices bind to every electron. This is the Laughlin one third state. For those who are interested, Laughlin wrote down a wave function, many body wave function, one of the few times in the history of physics, one of the others being liquid helium, that someone has written down a wave function for a many body state that is proven to apparently be exact. So you get Y dimples that keep you, um, uh, shift the electrons further apart, and there's less wasted kinetic energy. These are much gentler undulations than you have there. So this is a lower energy state. All right, so what are the excitations of that state? Well, this is the state of one third filling. This is the reference to the paper for those who are interested. To me, this is one of the most beautiful uh, articles I've read in my entire career. And you can actually understand part of what's going on, even as an experimentalist, and even with this being a deep theory paper. So, how do you picture a fractionally charged excitation? Because one of the conclusions of this paper is that the excitations had exactly one third charge. So let's remove one electron, one red sphere from the image above. That's going to give a local deficit of one electric charge. So you just created a local excitation of an electric charge plus E. If I remove this electron here, I've got a net charge here plus E because I've just removed minus E of charge. Now you let these three identical flux form wander around independently because they're now no longer bound to each other. Well, two of them wander off outside the picture, but the third one, each one of these wandering uh, vortices is carrying a third of a charge because it's symmetric and you've just taken one third of that dimple. So now here I've got one place where the lowest energy excitation is a single magnetic vortex with no electron attached with an electron deficit equivalent to one third of an electron. So this is the lowest energy excitation. It's one extra vortex in a one-third Laughlin state, and it has precisely E over three electric charge. It sounds like it might be related to quarks. Nobody's found a way uh, to find that link. But charge fractionalization arises in two-dimensional metal due to electron correlations that occur at the magnetic field, in which there are three times as many magnetic vortices as electrons. So, high energy physics has quarks, condensed matter physics has fractional charges, and these are these have been measured to precision of a few parts in 10 to the 8 for the electric charge. It's insanely precise at one third. Now we'll move to the copper square lattice. You start with a copper square lattice, and you put one electron on each site, each copper, and then you remove about 16% of them. And for some reason, in the range of about 10% removed to 25% of the electrons removed, you get high temperature superconductivity for reasons no one understands. This was discovered in 1986, became well known in 1987. The Nobel Prize was awarded to the discoverers. There still is a Nobel Prize for whoever comes up with the theory. It's not that we have no theory of high temperature superconductivity, it's we have too many of them. What we need is one, that, that is clearly describing the phenomena and has predictive power that can be tested. So this is the phase diagram for high temperature superconductivity, temperature and doping. It's whole doping. So as you remove electrons, you start here and you start moving in this direction. When you remove between 10% and 25% of electrons, you have superconductivity. And for about a dozen different materials, maybe two dozen different materials, the optimum transition temperature is about 16% removal of electrons. We have no idea why that common phenomenology exists. We understand the Fermi liquid. We understand the antiferromagnetism. We don't understand the pseudo gap. We call it the pseudo gap because we want to decide the fact that we don't know what the pseudo gap is. But it's a suppression in the number of electronic states available. 
And up here, there's a linear in T resistivity where the resistance goes linear in T. So this is data from a paper. You might recognize these two people from the audience, uh, Paula and, and Jose Augusto. Um, this is the resistance of a sample that they studied of LSCO. And you can see just how linear uh, this resistivity is up to room temperature. And it's been measured up. And actually, I like that effect so much. I'm going to do it again. This is how linear this is. And oftentimes, the best quality samples that will extrapolate exactly to zero. We don't have a clue why this linear resistivity exists. How can linear in temperature resistivity exist? Over such a wide temperature range, in some cases it's been measured up to 800 uh, uh, Kelvin, and it's still linear. Uh, why should this linear P exist in the normal state, the resistive state, right at the same doping where high temperature superconductivity is optimized? They they appear to be linked. They're certainly correlated, and it's either they're either physically linked, or somebody is playing a very cruel trick on us. They have two such striking phenomena that are incontrovertible and easy to observe. Zero resistance if you're at low temperature, linear and T if you're at high temperature. Well, how strange is this? For those who don't have a background in, in metal physics or semiconductor physics, if electrons were scattering off of phonons, first of all, if there's disorder, you have a finite resistance. There's no chance that there's zero disorder in lanthanum, strontium, copper oxide. It's loaded with disorder. So why does it extrapolate to zero? It should be a finite value. Then as you increase temperature from zero, your phonons form a black body distribution curve of population because they're, they're bosons. And so you're generating many, many new phonons that the electrons would scatter off of. So this is the curve you expect. And then if you go to very high temperatures, eventually your electron is going to scatter off of every atom that it encounters. Its mean free path will get so short that it equals the interatomic spacing, and then the resistance will level off because it can't scatter any more than that. And this just keeps going up. How can your electrons be scattering off of more than every electron? And then the slope, the scattering rate, depends upon Planck's constant. And this is usually roughly equal. It's not just less than, it's roughly equal. It's just temperature times Boltzmann's constant divided by Planck's constant. Why should that be the slope? So it's an entire seminar series that I could not deliver as far as the leading theories. They actually tie it to the same physics as, as black holes, and I don't begin to understand it. But the resistivity seems to know nothing about electron phonon scattering, nothing about the upper limit of scattering off of every electron. I didn't even mention electron-electron scattering, which would give you deviations. I didn't mention thermal expansion of the lattice. The lattice is changing, and yet the resistivity just goes straight linear with T. So these theories that I alluded to earlier are speculating that maybe the state is so quantum mechanically entangled, as is the case in black holes, that there are no recognizable plausible that it's a macroscopic quantum state where you don't have point-like excitations. There's no reason you should have them. Uh, uh, it's been a, it's a kind of a surprise that that theory has taken us as far as it has, the Fermi liquid theory, as it's called. And maybe these high-temperature superconductors in the cuprates with this linear T are clear evidence that we uh, have no quasi-particles in high-temperature superconductors. So the charge systems, the quasi particles in a two dimensional metal, you can get one third fractional charges. You can also get one fifth, one seventh, one ninth. Uh, in the copper square lattice, you can't do that with quark. And in the copper square lattice, you have high temperature superconductivity and perhaps no quasi particles at all. So let's move uh, with the balance of the talk to spin system. So we'll look at the triangular lattice in two dimensions and in three dimensions, and then we'll double up that copper square lattice. So why study materials? As I mentioned earlier, for an electron, every material is a new universe. And different electron behaviors lead to different material properties. So in a single layer of mobile electrons on a square lattice of copper atoms, where you remove between 10 and 25%, you get high temperature superconductivity. 
We don't know why. When a theory comes out, that's another Nobel Prize. And if there's a key experiment that proves that theory, that's probably another Nobel Prize as well. Not that we're in it for the Nobel Prizes, but we wouldn't turn them down if they were off. So let's look now at a single layer of localized electrons. So these electrons are not allowed to hop around. They're stuck on that point, but they've got a magnetic field. And they want to anti-align their magnetic field as best they can. And they're on a triangular lattice. What happens then? Well, you can't satisfy all of the electrons all the time on a triangular lattice. If they want to be anti-aligned with their neighbors, you have what's called magnetic frustration. A triangle of three antiferromagnetically interacting Ising spins, that's just fancy words for saying they can either be up or down, that's what Ising means, can't point in any other direction. Antiferromagnetic, meaning the nearest neighbors want to be anti-aligned. Well, you can't, you can't satisfy every electron. If you look at each one of those triangles carefully, uh, it's impossible for all three spins to be anti-parallel. And so you can have down, up, those guys are happy. Up, down, those two are happy. But down, down, they're unhappy. So the red line indicates where you have the frustration. And so as a result, with just three spins, you have six grams that are degenerate. When nature has a lot of options at low energies, it finds interesting things to do. If you think about it, a square lattice, I don't have a picture, but compared to a square lattice, it can be up, down, up, down. It's perfectly happy. The other state, down, up, down, up. There's only two ground states for a square lattice. There's six for a triangle. Sorry, for an isolated square, there's two. For an isolated triangle, there's six. Now let's make a lattice. For a square lattice that goes on forever, still only two. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down or down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and all the electrons are happy. But with a triangular lattice, you just get more and more degenerate states. There's essentially an infinite number of ways that you can um, get these degeneracies. Um, here I've gone up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, but you've got some frustration here, frustration there, frustration there. Geometrical frustration shifts many electronic states down to low energies, which gives nature many opportunities to do something interesting at low temperatures. And those are the systems that I and many other physicists find the interesting. So, how can we understand this story labs? Well, electrons can lower their energy by pairing up their magnetic fields to form a spin signal. So, nearest neighbor electrons will anti align your spins. Minus the spin flip, so it's quantum mechanics. Your lowest energy state is this spin single. And this is an ordered valence bond state. That's the language for this valence bond because they're occupied state. And it's ordered because, as you can see, there's a very clear order. But quantum mechanics, you can simultaneously add up every possibility. So you can have your pairing go in this pattern. Plus, you add that degenerate state, plus you add another degenerate state, and all these degenerate states can be added up to give you the quantum mechanical ground state. It becomes too complicated to understand. But this is a spin liquid whose wave function is a superposition of many different pairings of spins into spin singlets. You can see that if you save a certain amount of energy, epsilon, for each time you form a singlet, the energy of this state is the same as the energy of that state, it has the same number of singlets. So they're degenerate, and so they can mix to make a, a preferred quantum mechanical ground state. So spin liquids are insulators, no electrons move, but they should be able to carry a lot of entropy, and here's how. So this is a spin liquid ground state, and what does the excitation look like in a spin liquid? Just a local spin excitation, where you have one electron that's not pairing up with another electron to form a single. So it does not save energy. This is the lowest energy excitation. Simply an unentangled spin, one that's not paired with its neighbor. A spin on is an unpaired electron spin that moves by locally adjusting the valence bonds. So we're not going to move any electrons. All we're going to do to go from here to here is have this singlet no longer pair those two electrons, I have a pair of these two. 
the singlet just move from this side up to this side. So you're moving the spin of the electron without moving the charge. So a lone magnetic dipole can travel through the sample without transporting charge. Quantum matter has split the electron's spin from the electron's charge. The two properties of an electron, and you've separated them in this, in this material. Spin charge separation transports entropy because you can move these, these magnetic moments without transporting charge. So the answer to our question before is if you go from square lattice to triangular, you go from high temperature superconductor to spin charge separation. Incredibly exotic properties in a material that are just driven by geometry in this case. All right, so now let's look at a three-dimensional triangular lattice. Uh, it's a, called a pyrochlor lattice, which just means you have tetrahedra that share corners. And the fancy word for that is a pyrochlor lattice. Well, in these figures, it's now a, a Heisenberg spin. So whereas here it was rising and it can only point up and down, you can find materials where the spins can point in any direction. That's called a Heisenberg spin. So now you've got our 3D pyrochlor lattice with all these triangles. It turns out the ground state is that on every single um, tetrahedron, you obey the two in, two out rule. So here you can see there's two electrons with their spins pointing in and two pointing out. And here you've got two pointing in and two pointing out. And you can build the lattice to be as big as you want. And you can imagine there's an infinite number of ways you can do two in and two out. So once again, you give nature a lot of options on what to do. And when nature decides to do its create magnetic monopole. So how does it do that? The north monopole is in red. It features on that tetrahedron three in and one out. So here you've got one, two, three in and one out. The south monopole here in green has one in and three out. And all you have to do to get from here to here is flip a few spins. So by merely flipping these three spins, so they point up to the right instead of down to the left. Here it's up to the left instead of down to the right. So you can pair create with very little energy just by flipping spins because these, these, the, the difference in energy in flipping a spin is essentially zero. So you, you create a pair of monopoles by forming a string of spins. These are connected by a yellow line and you can separate these monopoles as far as you want. They can be arbitrarily far apart with virtually no cost in energy. The monopole pairs can firmly generate and recombine without staying paired. So this one can recombine with a south monopole that was generated somewhere else. Now, is this really happening where you've got magnetic monopoles? It turns out the answer is yes. There's a beautiful paper by Seamus Davis's group in this compound, which has this structure and has Heisenberg spins. The monopoles are real, but only inside the sample. And how did they do this? They put a sample of the material with a pickup coil to sense the noise. And anytime a monopole would go in or out, they would detect the noise on a squid. So if you have a low density metal, you can actually measure the fluctuation in charge through some detector and measure the shock noise and determine that your charge is quantized. In fact, they prove that it's one third charge in fractional quantum Hall effect by measuring the fluctuations, the noise generated when you were at either integer uh, or fractional states. So here, whenever a monopole moves through that coil, they're going to get a jump and they're going to get a series of curves. This is the noise spectrum versus frequency. Um, these are different temperatures from 1.2 Kelvin to 4 Kelvin. There's only two fit parameters, the overall amplitude and the frequency where they roughly cross. And with those two fit parameters, you get everything else. And so they've detected the magnetic noise from the fact that magnetic fields exist as point particles of magnetic charge in this material. So magnetic monopoles do exist in the universe. They just exist in the samples of dysprosium uh, tightening. 
So if you've got a two-dimensional triangular lattice, you get sin shard separation. If you have a three-dimensional triangular lattice, you get magnetic monopoles. So for my last example, we're going to turn to the double copper square lattice. So in a single square lattice, where you've removed some electrons, so the electrons are mobile, you get high temperature superconductivity. What do you get in the double layer of electrons on copper? Well, you remember this guy. It turns out that on purple was being studied by these folks, and this is a wonderful article, because they said, well, if one copper oxygen plane gets you high temperature superconductivity, we're physicists, we're simple people, we can't understand complex chemistry, but if one layer is interesting, what would two layers do? And they started doing a literature search once they started getting interesting information, and they turned out all kinds of papers from archaeology journals that were talking about this Han purple. So they had accidentally, because they were interested in analogs to high temperature superconducting systems, had stumbled across something that the, the Chinese had known about uh, for, for hundreds of thousands of years. Because it turns out that this system in Han purple is a quasi two dimensional magnetic insulator with a gap spin dimer ground state. And we're pretty sure that they didn't know that. <laughs> so, what do I mean by that? Well, it's just fancy words. Every electron has a spin, spin one half. And because the coupling is stronger between the layers than it is within a layer, these two electrons anti align their spins to lower their energy. They form a spin singlet. And so they then behave like spin one bosons. So you just turned electrons into bosons by simply choosing a different material. Well, in zero magnetic field, you have a singlet, which is the up, down, minus, down, up, times one over square root of two. And at higher energies, you have the triplets, which are either both spins down, both spins up, or down, up, plus. It's like up, down, plus, down, up. And if you turn on a magnetic field, you can imagine that the energy of this state doesn't change. The energy of this state doesn't change. This one goes up in energy, and this one goes down in energy. So a strong enough magnetic field, in this case higher than the Tesla, it raises the energy of that state, spin minus one. It lowers the energy of this state, spin plus one. And eventually, this state becomes degenerate with a singlet state at around 20 Tesla. And you've now given nature an option to do many different things. It has many degrees of freedom to do something interesting. It makes a gas of bosons that consist of local spin triplet excitations. So what do I mean by that? Well, in zero magnetic field, the electrons on each barbell are anti-aligned, they form the singlet state. A big magnetic field is going to start to create some spin-aligned triplons because they're degenerate. And these, the magnetic field controls how many pairs of electrons align their fields. These are the energy saving triplons. There's four of them in this diagram. And through simple spin flips, you can move the triplons. They can move from here to its neighbor just by flipping that spin and flipping that spin. So flip two spins doesn't cost energy, and your triplons can move. They can move, and because they're bosons, they can form a boson sign condensate even though not a single electric charge is moving. So the magnetism is in red, and the magnetism tells you how many aligned spins you have. You start with zero until you get to 23 tesla. You get more and more and more of them until you get to 50, and above 50, they're all spin aligned. Well, how do we know this is a Bose-Einstein condensate? What's the signature in helium when it undergoes the superfluid transition? It's specific heat measurement that has a lambda shift. So we've measured the specific heat going through this transition at temperatures as high as 3.9 Kelvin, and it's a perfect lambda transition. And so this is a magnetic field that's tuning the number of triplons, and they undergo both Einstein condensation, and we can measure that signature by measuring specific heat. And it turns out. There's six, at least six transition metal oxides that are discussed in this review paper. Some of them have this 
both Einstein uh, condensation transition temperature is high at 8 Kelvin over magnetic fields. It's all up to 62 tesla. Um, and this is a wonderful series of systems. They've measured critical exponents. They've done all kinds of detailed experiments on this system. So high temperature superconductors with one layer, magnetic Bose-Einstein condensation, which the Jean dynasty knew nothing about uh, in the double layer. So these are the exotic quasi-particles we've talked about. One third fractional charges, no quasi-particles at all, spin charge separation, magnetic monopoles, and magnetic Bose-Einstein condensation. And results from research on quantum matter, you get new fundamental particles, fractionalization of electrons, both by splitting the charge into thirds or fifths, or by separating the spin and the charge in the case of the triangular lattice. You get superconductivity that's robust in the presence of linear resistivity. We don't understand the reason for that. We don't understand the reason for that. It's only been since 1987. It took from 1911 to 1957 to understand low temperature superconductivity. That's 56 years, so we still have about 20 years left. And next generation devices and technology, sensors, detectors, thermoelectrics, some of the best solar cells are made out of matter and perhaps one day quantum computing. So I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we would love to have you come to the Magnet Lab sometime to do an experiment. We provide all the facilities free of charge based simply on a competitive proposal review process. Thank you very much. Right. So, so superfluids and um, bosons sign condensates could give you an, an exclusion of, of flux, is what you're saying. So, superconductors will do that. Um, do, you, do you need sort of a found effect, or you know, we don't know? Yes. Yes. So, so superconductivity is different than Bose-Einstein condensation. So you would not expect a Meissner effect, but you might expect superfluidity, which would be the motion of those spins without any dissipation. That's not been measured uh, so far. Nobody knows. So, so one thought would be if you could make wires out of this material and maintain the Bose-Einstein condensate, if you have superfluidity, you might be able to transport spin information without any energy dissipation. But nobody's done those measurements. So far, there's two major experimental pieces of evidence for Bose-Einstein condensation. One is the lambda transition, and the other is the critical exponents at very, very low temperatures match up to what the theorists claim uh, should be the right critical exponent. Yeah, they're, they're wandering around randomly, they're thermally generated, and so the number of them depends upon temperature, and the noise spectrum gets measured and has the exact right shape as well as temperature. Yep. And so that's telling you that the magnetic field is quantized in magnetic charge of a certain magnitude that equals one half electron spin. Well, one electron spin, spin one half. Yeah. Is it possible to drag the spin in that? Sorry, I couldn't hear it. Yes. It's it's hard to know how you would drive the spin. Uh, yeah, you can apply voltage for electric charges, not as clear with magnetic charges. Um, and, and I think that's part of the reason nobody's conceived of an experiment that's measured, you know, is the, the spin transport dissipation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just for a one third. Why one third yeah. and not one half or one three? So I have a few extra slides. And I'll just go quickly. 
This is the many body wave function. There are other terms out here that just make the equations work. But the key thing is here the electrons are at these locations. D is a complex number. So it's X plus IY. So for every electron that's a position XY, this is X plus IY. And you've got these difference terms. So the many body Laughlin wave function is a product of simple terms. For it to be odd, when you exchange electrons, the exponent has to be an odd integer, right? The wave function has to be odd. So it cannot be two, it has to be one, three, five, seven, nine. All right. Now, um, for electron wave functions, exchanging two electrons exchanges the, changes the sign of the wave function, right? And looping one electron around another is identical to exchanging two electrons twice. So for most systems, the wave function will pick up a phase of two pi. If you exchange electrons, it picks up pi. You exchange again, it picks up two pi, but not here. Here, if you look at the law for wave function, every time an ele electron exchanges with another electron, you pick up six pi because it's raised to a, a power of three at the one third state. At the one fifth state, you pick up 10 pi. But that's not a problem because you're still back around at the orbit. All right. So when you exchange two electrons with this wave function, you pick up six pi. Now, every time an electron loops around, sorry, I already said that. Every, oh, I, I reworded this. I reworded this. Oh, okay. No, I have a little bit right. In the image, every time an electron loops around another electron, it picks up a six pi phase. Not just because of the slave function, but think of it. If this goes around that, this electron has gone around three magnetic flux quantum. Every time an electron goes around the magnetic flux quantum, it picks up two pi. Because you've got three flux quantum, it picks up six pi. So that's the graphical depiction of this wave function. Because anytime you change two electrons, you pick up six pi here, or you pick up six pi in the picture. Okay, so the image is correct. There must be three plus one attached to each electron. And then if you remove the one electron and these three buoyancies wander off, they're each one third charge. Can't be one half charge, because then you wouldn't get the right phase agreement. The wave function wouldn't be odd. So the Laughlin wave function says you can get one third, one fifth, one seventh, one ninth charges. And, and but so far they've only been measured at one third. It's not prepared. <laughs> no, this was not prepared. <laughs> but this, this paper is astonishing because he writes down a many body wave function. He tells you how it behaves. He then writes down the positively charged excitation and gets it exactly right. He writes down a candidate for the negatively charged. He gets it almost right. All in four pages in physical review life. It's an astonishing thing. Any questions for which I'm not prepared? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is. Now, what do you see? Nothing. If they happen to wander into each other, you know, all of the intervening tetrahedra are perfectly happy. Because they're obeying the two in, two out rule. So they don't mind. And so those, the, the north and south magnetic monopoles, so all of these intervening tetrahedra are perfectly happy to out. Um, let's see, it's hard sometimes to see that. So that one's out, that one's out, this one's in, and that one's in. That tetrahedra is happy, this tetrahedra is happy. It's only the ones that have the monopoles that are violating the two in, two out. If this happens to loop around here, then this is yeah. So, so is there I mean, like some critical temperature that you talk? Um, I don't know, but the person we talked to is Robert Meissner, or Robert, not Meissner, uh, Mosner, Robert Mosner at, um, at um, the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. He did a lot of this theory, including showing that the local magnetic field looks like a magnetic field. 
it's not obvious in this picture that it looks like a, a magnetic model. What about that would be isolated things, right? Because you have to come in pairs. It comes in pairs, and but they can move independently. Which sounds like a free particle to me. I mean, we can serve very long. Do they have a different um, um, I mean, do they have different velocities, for example? Are they um, dispersed with duration? I don't know. Not even sure what would be the wave vector because they're point excitation, right? So I'm mean, not sure that they're good. yeah, but yeah. So you would think you would have some of the yeah. I don't know. I don't know. A good question. I would think that um, the north and south poles would be identical in properties. I don't think you'd have uh, you know electron hole asymmetry if you will. Yeah. So, I remember, I mean, many years ago, I went to a talk by Lockwood where, um, you know, he was talking about, you know, fraction you know, function, how it affects the wave function. But he was also suggesting, you know, that fractionalization, you say, that in quarks is, uh, right. is a phenomenon that, is, that might be related to. Right. I'm, I'm just wondering what, I mean, what the state of, the art is in the direction. Right. So the short answer is so am I. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not aware of anyone, including Bob, claiming that they've made progress over the last, let's say, 20 years. I may be wrong. Um, or others are out there. <laughs> but um, uh, it certainly was a very active area of exploration for a long time, but I'm not aware of anyone. Yeah. In Sega? In standard error minus. Yes. Right. So I, I, you're not going to have the lambda shape. You'll get a jump. So, you know, you, you can get a feature in specific heat, but it's not going to be this lambda shape. That you get out of those on some what is what is specific heat look like to a fair amount of I don't actually recall. Well, it's right. So, right. But it's not a lambda, which is no. infinite order lambda. And it has been the critical exponent can be different. So for that for that specific transition, there will be particular to hold hold. Mm -hmm. Any questions from grad students? Yeah. More layers. Right. So I'm not aware of anyone, um, certainly in high temperature superconductors, they've studied single layers, double layers, triple layers, and even more in systems where they grow the crystal one atomic layer at a time. I'm not aware of any magnetic systems that have three layers. I think the only ones I'm aware of don't. Right, the infinite number of layers where the lattice has the same coupling between the layers as in the plane. Uh, and then you don't get any of, of this. System. You would either get paramagnetism or anti paramagnetism, depending on what they want to be as the nearest neighbor. When you think about it, if you have a cubic lattice, three dimensions, and anti paramagnetic, you can, you can solve that trivially. It's up, down, up, down, up, down, wherever you go, and um, all the spins are happy. And, and you don't have a, a reason or a mechanism to form these trip lines. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So I did not know this is why I went into Kinnan Center. When I went into Kinnan Center, but I was delighted to discover that you can study.